Good morning. Let me give you a little impromptu welcome today. We're glad you're here, and uh, I'm going to get out of the way as soon as I can, as soon as you let me, and we'll let Danny come up here and give a real welcome. But we are approaching the time, or we're here, for election of deacons in our church body. And for all you members, this is the day that we, we vote uh, for deacons. Today we vote for two deacons. Now, let me encourage you, I do every year, and you hadn't got this in 38 years, but two is the number between one and three. That means you have how many hands? Two. That's how many you vote for, all right? And I'm, I'm not kidding you. We always get somebody that votes for three and somebody that votes for one. So we have to disqualify those ballots. So we want you to vote for two this morning. Uh, do you all agree with that? Hold your hands up if you do. For those of you, for those threes of you, you don't count. All right. Let me ask the ushers if they'll come if you're a member of anchor baptist church you hold your hand up and they'll get you a ballot to hold your hand up you got to hold it high these ushers i have a hard time seeing you when you get a ballot you can lower your hand don't vote till i tell you all right i'll tell you who to vote for all right You need a ballot, hold your hand up. Now, when you get that ballot, you're going to see a line drawn toward the top of that. And uh, don't vote for the people above that line. They're active already. But vote for two people below that line. You just put an X or a mark, any kind of mark you want to, but vote for two people below that line. When you get your ballot, go ahead and vote. If you hadn't got a ballot, hold your hand up. Vote for two people below that line. Two. If you're a member of the church, you vote. If you're not a member of the church, you need to be a member of the church. We'll give you an opportunity to do that later. If you need a ballot, don't have a ballot, hold your hand up. Everybody has a ballot. All right, as you vote, vote for two people below that line and fold your ballot in half, not in fourths, in half. And pass it to the middle aisle. Now, for those of you in the middle, I know that's confusion, so you just pass it either way. Just get it to the middle aisle, and the ushers will pick them up. We'll count those ballots after the service today. All right, it's time for the ballots to get in. You can't vote at home. We want you to vote this morning. And you pass those ballots in.
have all the ballots. <laughs> all right. Let's have a word of prayer, and I'll ask Danny to come up and give us a welcome. Father, we thank you for the leaders of our church. We thank you, God, that you call out men that are capable of leadership, have leadership ability. God, you want this church to go forward to be a, a voice for you, <coughs> to be a witness for you. We thank you, God, for our church. We ask you, God, to further bless our church, be in it, be active, and we know that we'll be successful in our Christianity as a church to the amount that you're here in it, to the amount that you have of it, and to the effect that you do through us, with us, in and around us. We ask you, God, to be with us today in this election, and we ask you, God, that we might have a people here that might reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to be in our service today and we call on you to be in our service, invoke you into it, and ask you to have a, the part in it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A nice crowd here. and uh, uh, Before anybody sends in, well, y'all didn't let the choir vote type notes and comments, they voted in the choir room early. The nursery people voted. They, we've handled all that behind the scenes. So everybody's getting a voice in the deacon election. So I uh, wanted to clear that up because I knew somebody was sharp-eyed and they would think we didn't let the choir vote. But we, we can tell which are their ballots though because they mark theirs in crayon. So, uh, but we don't know which crayon was whose. So. But uh, it's important business we take care of when we vote deacons in, and so we hope uh, uh, God's men get in those slots today. Uh, Announcement-wise, I'm looking through, and I, what caught my eye on the back, we've been talking about our Margaret Lackey fundraiser barbecue. That's next Sunday. So ladies, you don't have, or men, whoever does the Sunday cooking, or, uh, you know, we'll deprive some of the restaurants of some customers. Y'all plan to stay and eat barbecue with us? You may uh, may want to go ahead and order one of those whole smoked uh, Boston butts for 40 bucks, but uh, it's a pretty good deal. You can get $10 plate lunches with all of the fixings with the barbecue and all of the stuff that goes with it. You can dine in or carry out. So uh, make your plans and arrangements and you plan on eating with us next Sunday, okay? And uh, we just want to worship the Lord today. And again, we're glad you're here. Uh, looks like familiar faces, but if we've got somebody that's visiting maybe for the first time, please fill out that little insert that's in your bulletin just so we have a record of your visit. We'd love to know more about you, and maybe you want to know something about us, and you can do that on that little form. But we're going to go ahead and pray and let our children be dismissed for Children's Church and uh, let them get out to their time of worship, and then we'll continue in our. So y'all pray with me, please. Lord, we are thankful that we can gather here in your house this morning. Lord, it is just always awesome to be gathered with your people and be in your presence, Lord, as we worship together. Father, we thank you for those that were here for the Sunday school hour. I thank you for those Sunday school teachers and the preparation and the work they put in to bring in those lessons each and every Sunday, Lord. Thank you for the ones that are anxious to participate in Sunday school and to be in that time of study. Lord, it's a time of study, but also a time of fellowship and a growing closer together with other Christians. Father, we just pray for our children now as they're about to be dismissed that as they go to their time of worship, Lord, that they have a good time, but they also have a worshipful time and they learn more about Jesus. Father, we just pray for so many of our members and the family of members, Lord, that are dealing with illnesses and sickness, and there's been quite a few that have uh, had loved ones to go on to heaven. Lord, we just pray for those folks and those families. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort and strength, Lord, and we know you're able. Father, we just pray that you... Add your blessings to our time of worship this morning. Help us to prepare to receive the message that Brother Gerald is going to share with us, words that we know you're, 
given him to speak to us. Help us to hide them in our heart. Help us to learn today. Help us to be better equipped to serve you, Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is great to be back with you all here this morning. We're going to start our service with a victory in Jesus. We're going to sing three verses, not two or four, but three verses. If you'll all stand and sing. I heard an old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary. To save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's unholy, and I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. Today's scripture is Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we see here today in our scripture that Paul identified himself as being called, and we know that you've mentioned in another scripture that we are called according to your purpose. We pray, Lord, that we would each fulfill that purpose that you have seen in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would be with 
us as we are witnesses in the world. Help us to show others your love. We ask that you'd be with our pastor as he brings the message you have prepared for us. Help us to retain it and use it. Forgive us when we sin. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted to go ahead and tell you about a new choir time for our rehearsal. We're moving until 5 o'clock. So if any of you are interested in that, come on out. We would love to have you there. We're all nice people, smiling faces. So come on out. We'll be here at 5 o'clock today. Our next hymn is going to be Come Alive. we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves but we know that you are God yours is the victory we know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we'll step into the valley unafraid. You alone can save. We call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts. Come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. God of endless mercy, God of unrelenting love, rescue every dawn bring us back the wayward sons and by your spirit breathe upon them show the world that you alone can save you alone can save we call out to dry bones come alive come alive we call out to dead hearts come alive Come alive, up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. Breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe, O oh breath of God. Breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe. Breathe the breath of God, now breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, now breathe. Breathe out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. Amen.
Thank you, Lee, for that message and song, and it's amazing how God can open our eyes and causes us to see things that we did never saw until he did open them. I want you to take your Bibles and open them to the book of Romans, and although I want to talk to you about just one verse today, that's the most important verse for us to see because it begins the book. But let me tell you a story before that. In the 60s, accessories were not prominent on cars that you bought. If you had a car with a lot of accessories, you were looked on as being privileged. There's a woman that told a story that grew up not far from us. She grew up in southern Alabama. She said, on one occasion, in the middle of the summer, my father told me, he said, roll up your window, roll it up smooth and easy like it's electric. She said, I was six or seven years old at the time, and I didn't know what he was talking about. So I asked him why. And he said, so everybody thinks that we have air conditioning. Well... I told my father, and it was the middle of the summer, as hot as it could be, hot even with the windows rolled down. She said, I told my father, Daddy, they're going to know that we don't have air conditioning when they see four people sitting in this car sweating like pigs and panting like dogs. 
But he insisted, and she said, I knew what I'd get if I didn't roll that wonder down, so here I go. Smooth, easy cranking like it's electric. And she said, there, as I rolled that window up, I felt the last of the breeze coming through that window. We live in a world of pretense, don't we? Hardly anybody lets anybody else know who they really are. And it's hard to know who or what is real. My pastor at Broadway Baptist Church had a favorite verse, and he'd go to it often. And it deals with the reality. It's in 2 Chronicles 16. And it simply says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. That verse simply says, God is looking for who is real. Throughout history, God seems to have focused on several people, even in church history, that have become important to us. We have the person of Martin Luther, who in 1511 found himself as a monk in the Roman church. He was teaching a class on the book of Romans, and he looked down and he read Romans 1.17, and God seemed to open his eyes for the first time to that verse. And the verse simply said, The just shall live by faith. He said then he realized that he was in a religion that was a works religion. And they told him that he had to keep certain sacraments in order to keep his salvation, that he had to work for it. But he found out, as God would show him, that man was made right before God without any action that man does, but by simple faith. It was a brand new truth. It changed him, and it led to the Protestant revival. That's why you and I are here today. We're Protestants against the Roman church. There's another man that's famous, John Bunyan. Something we don't often hear about John Bunyan. He was an Englishman, grew up around Bedford, England. He spent 12 years in a Bedford jail because he would not give up preaching. But while he was in that bed for jail, he read the Bible and he got on the book of Romans and he wrote an allegory mocking the book of Romans and that allegory is called Pilgrim's Progress. There's another famous man by the name of, of John Wesley. John Wesley came to Georgia as a missionary and a, and a young man he came to be a missionary to the American Indians. But when he got here, he says he failed miserably. Now on the ship back to England, there came a hurricane in the Atlantic. It took that ship and it threw it back and forth and all of the crew and the captain on that ship were in a panic. They were scared to death because they knew that they weren't going to live through that storm. He said, but there was one group of Moravian Christians from Czechoslovakia. They were calm and cool as could be. They sang hymns. They quoted scripture. They prayed, but they were not in a panic. And he said when he got back to England at Aldersgate, he was walking down the street, and he read what Martin Luther had written about Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. And he says, my heart was changed. It was strangely warm. Now, all three of these men I've mentioned to you have one thing in common. They were all influenced by God as God the Holy Spirit took the book of Romans and made it personal. Book of Romans is the sixth book in the New Testament. It is the longest letter, or we call it a book or an epistle, that the Apostle Paul wrote. Let me tell you why Paul wrote the book of Romans. 
He was in Corinth at the, one of the most problematic carnal churches in all of the New Testament, and he was in a place where he couldn't leave. He was teaching them what they had done wrong, their falseness. He couldn't let it go. He couldn't leave that church. He wanted to go to Rome because he had gotten a message that a new church had formed in the city of Rome, and he wanted to go there. He wanted to explain what the Christian life was to these Romans. He wanted to tell them the essential principles of Christianity, what being saved was all about, what being a Christian was all about, but he couldn't go. And so instead of going to Rome, he wrote this book of Romans, and it turns out to be the most concise, concentrated, doctrinal book in all of the Word of God. It is a book that many people will go to before any other book. But you might ask, why did Paul think he was qualified to write such a book? How could one human being like you and me write a book explaining all the essential principles of Christianity and what a Christian was and who a Christian was? Why did Paul qualify? May I say to you, in the best way I know how, Paul was the real deal. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean that there was no pretense, no fake. He was honest, he was open, and he was true. Years ago, the emperor of China had a famous orchestra. And one particular member of this orchestra did not have any, I mean, no musical ability at all. But he had weaseled his way somehow into this orchestra. And when they had concerts, he always pretended to play, but he didn't know music at all. He loved the attention he got from being in that orchestra. He loved the money that he got from being in that orchestra but he couldn't play a note. One day the emperor had an idea. The emperor wanted to have each member of the orchestra play him a special solo performance. Now that man whose life was only pretend realized he couldn't escape having to admit his lie. And what he did he killed himself. He committed suicide. The event coined the phrase that we sometimes use of being willing, unwilling to face the music. Let me ask you a question. Are you the real thing? Are you the real deal as far as God is concerned? Or are you just living a life of pretense, going through the motions, doing what you have to do to look presentable to everybody else. But are you the real deal? What if your Christianity became a solo act? What if this morning I asked you if you would leave your pew and I pointed to you and called you by your first name and you come up here and stand behind this pulpit and give your testimony as to how you became a Christian. How did God save you? You come here and just simply share your faith. Now, I know some of you are thinking, now, Brother Jill, I just can't do that. I'm okay one-on-one -on -one or in a corner with somebody. I can talk uh, to them in a conversation, but just speaking in front of a crowd, no, that's not me. I can't do that. The Bible says we shall all appear and stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. And one day, you're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the King of all glory, and give a solo performance yourself. And given that solo performance, how are you going to describe your life? We wonder what real Christianity is today. We have so many mock churches 
and fake preachers and people who are criminals as leaders of the churches today and so many crimes committed even by churches today, we look at how Paul described his life. You say, well, man, that's, that's different. Paul was an apostle. And you're not the, an apostle in the sense that Paul was, but he puts down the essential guidelines of who a Christian really is. Look at that first verse, if you will. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Look up here just a minute. Now, I know I've got your heads bobbing, and I do that to keep you awake. You know what the second century description of the Apostle Paul was? Paul was described by the historians of that day as a short man. He was short in stature. He was bald. He had no hair. He was hook-nosed. He had an eye disease. And the eye disease that he was thought to have at that time looked like the eyeballs were almost protruding from their sockets. Were not pleasant to look at. He's described as not being an eloquent speaker. But God used him to change the world. And some of you think you have nothing much to offer God, but look at what he did with this man. One verse this morning is a description of Paul given by himself. This is what Paul knew he was. This is who Paul was in Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write, not just for him, but for us too. It's not a physical description. It's really kind of like an autobiography. It's clues to why Paul was such a dynamic Christian. Because it cuts away all the facade and all the peripheral stuff that we've tried to add to what a Christian is today. It brings us down back to the real deal, the real thing. Paul was a man, first of all, who knew his master. He says in this verse, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. A bondservant, that's a unique word for slavery. In the English language, we have about 26,000 words, and it would surprise you to know how few of those words we use in our everyday communication. But in the Greek, there are 122,000 words to use. The Greek, Koine Greek, is much more accurate and so Paul picked out of those word, 122,000 words, he chose a very specific word to describe himself. The word is doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. It means a bond slave, a bond servant. Now Jewish uh, slavery was unique. A Jew could have another Jew as a slave. If you owed a man a great deal of money, you could work it out by being his slave. But a Jewish slave could only be a slave to a Jew for seven years. And at the end of that seven years, the Jews had what they called the, the year of Jubilee. And at the year of Jubilee, in seven years, a Jew was released from slavery. Or a Jew that was a slave, had a choice of being released. That was a point of decision. Some slaves did not want freedom. They made a choice to stay as a slave. Now what that owner would do was to take that slave who made a choice not to have freedom, but to continue being a slave to his master, they would take him to a priest. That priest would take him to a special person that would take him to a doorpost. And he would put that slave's ear against that doorpost and with an awl, A-W-L, a pointed instrument, he would bore through the ear of that slave. 
it would be a kind of a mark or brand, a stigmata that identified that slave. It was a sign that he has forsaken his own free will. You know what the people would say in the marketplace when they saw that brand on the ear of that person who had forsaken his freedom? They would think, what a wonderful master he must have. He must be kind. He must be generous. He must be loving. Where would the Apostle Paul be if he walked into Anchor Baptist Church today? How would he fit into our congregation? Would he fit in here as being a slave? Nobody is a slave in our modern day 21st century Christianity in any church, in any Baptist church. Nobody considers, no Christian considers himself or herself a slave. We have the opposite idea today, and that's where we're off base. We have the idea that Jesus is to serve us, right? Sunday morning and all its worship is all about me, right? Wrong. It's not all about me. It's all about Jesus Christ. We've gotten away. We've left our first love. When Paul introduced himself as a bond slave, it was a term of derision. There were about 600,000 bond slaves in the city of Rome in a population of about a million. Paul could have said, Paul a citizen of Rome because he was. His father was a citizen of Rome. His mother a Jew. Are there any bond slaves around today? Have there any popped up in our lifetime as Christians? I think Mother Teresa would qualify. She's dead now. She did some of the pitiful ministry that most of us would not touch. She went to one of the poorest countries in the world, in India, to Calcutta. And she ministered to people with the most grotesque things wrong with them. Some of them had leprosy, whose body parts were rotting away, cankerous, running sores, and she ministered. She had one guy follow her around, and he said, as he looked over Mother Teresa's shoulder, and he said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. You know what she said? She said, I wouldn't either, but I'd do it for Jesus for nothing. You see, what I, God is trying to do this morning for you in the book of Romans, whether you're here as a member or a visitor or once in a while, he has a reason for you to hear this this morning because he wants to give you a description of who you need to be and who you are in Christ. You ever have anybody bring you a picture and they tell you it's a picture of you and they tell you how much you don't look like that picture anymore? Huh? You ever had that? You want to make them eat that picture, don't you? I have people bring pictures of me when I first got to the church and they'll say, Our brother Gerald, you know, you don't look like you did when you came. And you know what I want to say? I never say it. This is, if you bring me a picture and you say that, this is what I'm thinking. You don't look like you did when I came to this church. But the book of Romans contains a depiction of what a true believer in Jesus looks like. Does it look like you? Are you a slave of Christ? Paul de described himself as a slave of Christ. What does that mean? That means that you are a Christian that is not resisting God's authority. To not resist God's authority is a huge secret to living a successful Christian life. 
is trusting him without trying to call the shots or setting the agenda for your life. It's not doubting or questioning the will of God and the ways of God, but learning to trust God, whatever he tells you. Whatever he tells you through his word and through his spirit. Paul not only was a man who knew his master, but he was a man who knew his mission. Look back at that first verse in Romans, if you would. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Paul considered himself an apostle. Now, to be an apostle is different from being a disciple. A disciple is one who learns or follows but an apostle is one who is sent forth. Paul says, I was one that was born out of due time. He was saying I wasn't included in the original 12, but I saw Jesus. He writes in 1 Corinthians this verse, he says, then last of all, he was seen by me also. He's talking about Jesus. As by one born out of due time. He's saying I wasn't born with the rest of the apostles. I was a little older. For I am the least of the apostles. What did Paul mean when he said I am called to be an apostle? And you say what does that have to do with me? How is that relevant to my life as a Christian? When he says, I was called to be an apostle, he's not saying anything, but I was called as to be commissioned for a specific use. If I ask you today as a congregation, hold up your hand if you think God has ever made a mistake. Nobody would hold their hand up. If you did, you'd be wrong. How many of you think that God would do something for nothing? When God brought you to Him and He made you a Christian, He commissioned you for a specific use. Now you might find that hard to believe. But you have been summoned for a very important task because God didn't save you for nothing. He saved you for a specific use. More than one use, probably. But He saved you for something. He has you Christianized, or He's made you a disciple and brought you into His family for you to do a specific thing. But most Christians look on Christianity this way. Well, I'm not useful to God. I don't have anything to offer God. I don't think God can use me in any way. But God saved you for a specific use. He knew who you were. He made you. He brought you into a certain family, gave you a certain background of education or no education. He's brought certain experiences in your life that nobody on this earth has had just like you. And He has a specific use for you. When I think about that, I think about a key. Most of us have a keychain. We have a lot of keys. But let's just look at one key this morning. It's used for several things. You know I've seen people use keys to punch a hole in a bell. I've seen people use keys as a screwdriver. And some of you are guilty, I can tell by looking at you. Some of you use keys as a weapon. Some of you husbands might show marks from a key that your wife might have used. I'm just kidding you. Some of you even use keys to pick your teeth. What I'm saying is this. Keys are used for a lot of different reasons. But though they have a lot of potential uses, there's only one real purpose. God saved you to do one purpose in your life. He may have done it. He may be doing it with your life, whether you know it or not. 
And sometimes he lets you know what that purpose is, and sometimes he doesn't. But he's, he never does anything for nothing. A key is designed with personality. It has cuts and ridges where little teeth go up further than others, plain off, and for only one lock. You are the only key that can unlock what God wants you to accomplish in this world. Some of us have keys on a keychain, and some of those keys we don't know what go to. But we don't want to throw them away because someday we think, I might discover their use. There are some of you sitting in this sanctuary this morning, and you're not sure why God made you and why He saved you, but you just keep going, hoping you'll discover your real purpose. Let me tell you how God can focus you, and direct you. It's by prayer. It's by the Word of God. It's by the obedience you have to God. It's through the common relationship and fellowship you have with a person of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. You can keep yourself busy with many things, but to miss God's calling is going to be tragic in your life. The level of my faith rises above the level of my fear that I have for something God might call me to do, then anything is possible in God's will. Do you have that kind of confidence in the sovereignty of God over your life and His willingness to do great things through you? God does not use great people but he uses great faith Hebrews 11 is a list of people who obtain things for God that no other people obtain but when you look at that list those people were nothing without God but they allowed God in spite of their fear to use them and accomplish mighty things I went to seminary in Memphis we got to see and hear a lot of great preachers. But one of my favorite was one who was physically close to the seminary. Right across the street in Memphis at that time was the Bellevue Baptist Church. Adrian Rogers pastored that church. He was one of the greatest communicators for God the Southern Baptists have ever had. He was the president of the Southern Baptist Conven Convention. He was really a great preaching pastor. To hear him was to hear a great orator that God had gifted. And he used his talent for God. And he influenced young preacher boys like me. But when Adrian Rogers was a young man, he was in a church and the preacher called on him to pray. And he shook his head and said no. You see, he was intimidated to do even that. That much for God at that point in his life. You may be shy. You may be backwards. You may be not in the spotlight. Not know enough Bible, you think. Not be grounded enough. But God wants to shock the world, your world, with a difference He'll make through your life. That's what God does. He makes all things new. He uses people who really think they can't be used and people around them think they can't be used. Paul was a man who not only knew his master and not only knew his mission, but he knew his message. Look back at verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus, Christ called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God. You know what that means? That means that God pulls you out from the world. If you are here today in Anchor Baptist Church and you're a Christian, 
You are the elect of God. You've been separated from the rest of the world to be in God's family. And the good news of the elect, one of the characteristics of who a Christian should be and how God says a Christian ought to be is that you have been given a gem. Notice here, he says, I'm separated to the gospel of God. You know what? That's not just for Paul. That's us. When you were saved and you came down this aisle or some other aisle and you came through the baptistry and you made a profession of faith and your name was put in the Lamb Book of Life, if you are the real deal, if you're the real Christian, today you're separated to the gospel. You know what gospel means? It means good news, good spell. It means the good news of God. God gives you a gem. It's like a, a mag magnificent diamond that he gives you. He gives you a gem. What is this gem? It is to tell the world that God through Christ has called you out of darkness into a light. He's called you from not understanding who God is and what the Bible is all about, what Christianity is all about, what you should be all about, into knowing who God is. That's a gem. If you have a, a, a brand new ring and you have a diamond, I know how you women are. You can't wait to show that around, can you? Well, it's the same with the gospel of Christ. Yet we keep it to ourselves and we hide it. Paul says, I've been separated to the gospel of God. It means to live a life that's holy in our love and our reverence and our devotion to Christ and to be set apart from the ways and the thoughts and the attitudes of this world. The Bible tells us love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, but we try to love this world and make it heaven when it's not heaven. You see, here is a description of a Christian. You say, oh, this is Paul. Paul was a Christian before he was an apostle. But Paul identifies himself. He says, a Christian is one who knows his master. Therefore, I'm a servant. I'm a slave. He was one who knew his mission. Therefore, I've been sent. You know, so have you. A Christian is one who knew his message. I've been separated. Paul writes this great book of Romans, and he's given all of the major doctrines at a certain point, and he comes to a certain point, and he seems to stop. He gets to that 12th chapter. And this is what Paul says. It's like he puts down his notes and he says, because of all that I've written in this book of Romans up to this point, I've told you all I know. I've given you all my heart. I've shown you how to be a real Christian. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and excellent and perfect will of God. Do you describe your life the way Paul described his? It's a description of a Christian. Let's pray. Father, help us to be who you want us to be. Help us to be real before you. God, however 
much talent we have or how little talent we have, I pray you'll let us be real before you. Let us be the real deal and not be fake people who parties all week and then comes to church on Sunday as a hypocrite. Help us to know the Lord Jesus Christ above even ourselves. And help us to know who we are in Jesus. And not just be pretend Christians, but be the real deal. God, make us real for you. Let us be ones who reflect the person of Jesus Christ. And let Christ live his life out through our lives. God, help us overcome the hardships of this world. God, you make things happen that we don't like. We wouldn't have. We wouldn't do it this way. But you make things happen to make us who you want us to be. God, form us. I pray, God, if there are those here that need to make decisions today, maybe some here who need to make a decision to become a follower of Jesus, who've never given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, who've never been saved, I pray they'll make that decision today. Those here who need to make rededications of their lives, who may want to be this member of this church, I pray, God, that you'll cause them to make that decision today. I pray this prayer and give this invitation to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you to stand. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Richard, you come and lead us. And you make that decision that God would have you make. Richard. You for having been with us today and I hope God's touched your heart in some way in some corner of your life and I hope God has an influence after you leave this church today on your life let's go to the Lord in prayer and I'll ask Tommy Latham to close us in a word of prayer